So welcome all of you to our series here of Talks from 42 Courses and I'm honestly delighted today to be joined by today's guest, Nula Walsh. Nula is the CEO of Mind Equity. <clears throat> she's a behavioral scientist. She's a TED Talk speaker. She's the founding director of GABS, which you may or may not have heard of, the Global Association of Applied Behavioral Scientists. Is that correct, Nula? Is that the right? Yes, uh, yes, yes, that's it. Uh, she was the first female director of the British and Irish Alliance. I mean, the list goes on. You're very welcome today, Nula, to talk about your new book, Tune In. Thank you very much, Louise. It is great and ironic to be here, given that we were involved in a book club four years ago. That is so, right. And I will just tell everybody, yeah. Nula uh, and I met in a book club, as she said. We have joined these events weekly, uh, many, many times together as listeners like yourselves. Uh, most recently, Nula has also been hosting these events through her role in GABS. And now, of course, you're taking on the new role of joining these events, Nula, as an author. How does that how does that feel, Nula? Uh, a little bit different, to be fair. Be fair. It's 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 I'm not sure which is worse, being the interviewer or the interviewee, but I think I think it's it's a I did think that writing the book was the hardest part, actually. And I thought even getting endorsements was incredibly hard. You know, it's not easy. Um, unless they're your friends. But now I've discovered that actually the third leg of all of this is actually marketing the book and talking talk about it's okay because I did write it the way I do I I do remember most of it, um, but I think I think this is another section that people sort of underestimate. So well, I don't know if we're going to you're going to be talking about that that angle at all, but it is it's an interesting thing because I know a lot of people think about doing it. I did and I did for a long time, but the actual doing of it. Um, and the process and the industry, the publishing industry is a is a was a whole new world to me in terms of in terms of the process, um, the, you know what you should do, what you shouldn't do, etc. Very very interesting. Yeah, maybe mm. we could have a whole other uh, other event talking about the actual process of writing the book. But um, as you say, being an interviewee like myself is an absolute mm. pleasure to be able to speak to so many interesting people. Uh, Nula, I've given a sort of introduction about yourself, but for people who don't know you, you know, tell them a little bit more about yourself other than my introduction. OK, um, well, I, I guess I wear, I wear many hats, um, too many hats sometimes, but the bulk of my career is in investment management. So I'm, I was three decades in financial services, investment banking, investment management with, you know, BlackRock, Merrill Lynch, and, and a few others. So that's sort of the, the, the bulk of my career. And maybe five, six years ago, I left and I did the LSE. Um, I went to the London School of Economics and I did the Masters in Behavioral Science. So again, that's another story. Going back to school in my, in my late, late years was quite difficult. But it was a fantastic, fantastic uh, course. And what I learned there was how to articulate and label, I would say label, uh, the human biases and the behaviours that, that we under, undergo. So what I wanted to do then was almost just apply that because I have, I have, I have a number of seat, seats on different boards, as you said, um, and I have my own consultancy. So what I wanted to do after that was put it all together, if you like, and just um, make sense of it for, for, for people. So, so it's a very eclectic background someone was asking me about the career transitions so i have done a number of transitions to be fair but but but, but all within a within a space so if i had to put it all together i guess i've got three strands i've got a consulting angle i've got um the writing and then i've got this the boards piece where i work with un women human rights organizations the innocence project so that plays to my background and um, one of my earlier um academic degrees was was around philosophy but also then I went on to do forensic psychology so if you read the book that's where that's where it came from so you will see in the book my whole life I've got CEO stories I've got you know presidents astronauts sports huge amount of sports stories um, and then also but a huge amount from from the criminal world as well 
and serial killers um you know just to the the unethical side of side of life so yes, let, it all let, comes together in the book i guess louise i, I feel it's slightly come full circle and when i gave all of the examples uh, in the book and I do have an ed- I do have an editor and publishers that said they had never seen so many examples. They normally have to tell writers to give me a few more. It, I, I probably wrote like I speak pretty fast. So it's story, 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 just to make the point. If you want to learn more, you can, you know, read up on a huge story because some of them are, are pretty big and well known. But I just used them to make the point. And for me, that that, that made it richer. Um, and, and I was able to put in some stories that, I, that moved me. And that was sort of one of my own filters that. I, I had to have some connection with the story or to think it was really interesting or fascinating or something and then because my thinking was well if most you know if something if one person likes it usually when it comes to the emotional triggers we all sort of feel x y and z when we watch netflix or or, or read different books yes yes let's turn to the book and as you say there's a lot in there nula there's a lot of stories tune in how to make smarter decisions in a noisy world obviously about the decision making process and you tell us in the book that surprise surprise not all decisions have happy endings we can tune in to the wrong voices uh, people can tune into voices of evil. People can tune into voices maybe of uh, over ambitious reach, um, voices that maybe aren't realistic. Uh, and as you say to us, when policymakers tune out, I mean, this can lead to huge human error, fatalities. Um, what was it, do you think, Nula, that made you feel that honing in on this particular area of, I suppose, the different categories that we'd consider to be under sort of behavioral science Mm -hmm. is this decision making process. What made you decide to tune in yourself, if you'll excuse the phrase, into this particular area? It's It's a brilliant question, Louise, because I didn't initially. I didn't initially, as I went through, so initially I thought I would almost do a compendium and we'll talk about it later, but I have a series of 10 traps. So basically what I did was combine a lot of different biases under some of these traps, like power-based traps or ego-based or risk-based, et cetera. So what I was trying to do initially was, well, what are the power-based traps? Are the biases? What, What ones in particular feed that? And when I did that, okay, there were a few, um, and we, you would know some of them, authority bias or, you know, um, being too compliant, um, all of those ones. But what I tried to do then was say, what voices were people listening to? So it's easy if you think of ethics, right? Um, did you listen to the voice of conscience mm-hmm. or not? Um, but also the, it wasn't as simplistic as just one voice. So you could have the voice of familiarity or the voice of um, probability. So you've got all these probabilistic um, biases that we, when it comes to numbers and we're doing numerical evaluations. So the voice of experience or the voice of self-interest, glory, um, you know, compassion and, and convenience. And, and, in this, and I argue that, of course, in, in a fast paced world, we listen to the voice of convenience. It, it rides very high over the voice of common sense or rationality. So we rush to misjudgment, particularly in this noisy, fast paced world so yes you're right you can have these sort of um intangible voices that you listen to and but also i also wanted to make it very real in terms of do you listen to the first voice you hear which is probably it could be the most it could be the person next to you or the most senior voice the leader in the room the expert voice or the fastest voice or the the voice you admire most so we all listen to idols you know whoever we admire but they're not always right. And neither are experts and neither is your boss and neither is your parent or your partner. But we rush to judgment. So, and then mavericks, we tune out mavericks mm. and braggers and boasters, but we tune into the gossipy person or the fun person. So it's really, it's an invitation to think differently about who you're listening to mm. and why. And just ask yourself, why am I listening to this person? Yeah. What do they know that I don't? Should I be, should I be thinking a little bit differently? Um, and the filter with all of the, the, the stories is, did this person tune in or tune out? And was mm-hmm. I able to 
map onto it, whether it was the voice of reason or evil or authority or this or the identity traps were all about the need for acceptance. You know, so FOMO, we want to be we want to be judged well. So what do we do in that moment when we're making a decision? How vulnerable are we to impression management? And are we really buying a new car to impress the neighbours? You know, or because we really want it, can we afford it? It's any decision. Why you leave your job? Why you leave your partner? What house do you buy? And, but in business, it's about important leadership decisions rather than rather than the individual decisions. And you mentioned there the type of person that we listen to and who we are influenced by, and it can be somebody completely uh, peripheral to our to our, our reality, to our real life. And that sort of leads in well, Nula, to this um, model that you have created in which, so this would be a person of, of power, I presume. This is the P of power for this model of perimeters that you've created. And these are what you can explain, explain to everyone who's joined us today, how you came about this model and how it's to actually work when we're trying to think through a decision. Yeah, well, well, the first thing is to we it, it it reflects when you are in a given situation. So let's just take power. It's not somebody with power. The point is when you are chasing power. So you might be a graduate, you might be in your first job, you, you might not, you might be at the top and still chasing power, but you're chasing power, right? So you're either you could be chasing power, you could be in a position of power, and and be so desperate to keep it. What decisions are you making? i.e. what traps, what, what biases are you liable to fall into and be triggered by? And then thirdly, or you could be, you could have lost power. So you could have been fired. You could have, you know, uh, it could be a CEO who's fired or an individual who's fired. You could be anyone who has lost your either actual power or perceived power. So you might be, you might come second. You might be ranked number two. You might think, well, I've lost face. So, so you're losing something. And the, the, the question then is, Okay, now now you are at risk. Now you are at risk of rushing to misjudgment and making the wrong call because you are so involved in these situations is under stress, uncertainty. You're you're triggered. What what biases are you likely to fall into? So that's what it's a power based misjudgment trap. So it's a misjudgment trap that you're liable to fall into when you are vulnerable to um, power or whether you have a high or a low ego or whether you're risk seeking or risk averse whether you're thinking about the present or the past. And I go through these 10 different um, scenarios. They're not scenarios, they're situations. Mm. And they stand for the word perimeters, which is about narrow thinking. And I, I, I've given you some of them. P, power, ego, risk, identity, memory. Memory was a very good chapter, a very interesting and very mm. hard chapter to write, I would have thought. Um, memory, ego. I'm testing my own memory now. Ego, sorry, not ego, emotion, time, ethics, relationships, as in the crowd, and stories. So even when I say those words, you can think, oh, yes, I'm liable to, to make a misjudgment when I'm vulnerable to, you know, just accepting stories with, at face value without tuning, tuning in to the right storytellers, the right messengers, decoding what you hear, reinterpreting what you hear, rather than misinterpreting and reflecting. So this whole thing is about reinterpreting. It's not about listening. It's about reinterpreting what you hear and going through those second order effects and thinking why, 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 particularly in, in an important situation and whose voice are you listening to? And then, of course, you have all about the messenger effect. And we know from the messenger effect, for example, that we listen to the most um, familiar voice, the most credible voice and scarily the voice that you like. So the likability mm -hmm. factor. So the voices that you like and we tune out the mavericks and, 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 and the naysayers and even though they may be the right voice in a particular situation. I mean, and as humans, I mean, we are so easily influenced. What I found um, since reading the book, Nula, I mean, often you'll read a book and it will have one of these sort of acronyms of a model. And when it comes to real life, they're not very practical or you don't remember them. <laughs> and uh, what I've found since reading the book is, that it little bits of them sort of keep, keep returning to me as I sort of think about it. And I think you, the, how the model seems most effective is that sort of any of them can stand on their own. 
mm. to make you know you can oh is that something I should be considering so it's not necessarily one of those acronyms that you need to be going one two three four five they each are independent in terms of recognizing how it might be playing a role in in biasing a decision is that the way in which you it, hoped they would work Nola? Well, well, yes and no, because yes, you can read a standalone chapter. On, you can read power, mm. ego, or impression management, mm. identity. So you can read. So you can read that. However, they're not on their own. There is a force multiplier effect. So if you are analysing any different situation, so a power-based trap, you know, when you're chasing power or losing power, well, of course, ego is going to come into effect there and and, and affect your decision making. It's going to affect the risks that you take. So it's going, you're going to be filled with emotion. So you need to understand the emotional triggers. Are you talking about regret, envy, um, greed, fear? What is it? And, you know, all of and there are 27 emotions. So knowing which one it is. So regret, regret avoidance, envy is huge when you're, when, when you're talking about careers. So I think you're right. They are standalone because each chapter could have been a book and it really could. So and so it's deliberately slightly high level but enough for you to run through in your head. Am I guilty of or vulnerable to P-E-R-I-M-E-T-E-R-S? Anyone can remember them because they're kind of easy. Um, and then if you think, I'm feeling really emotional right now, this is really what it is, and you know it, just go and read the piece and do it, go through a checklist. So I'll be, I'll be issuing a checklist shortly that has just a very simple, here they are, and they're actually 75. So I've got, I've got about six or seven in, in the 10, to be fair, and then I've got a few others dotted around. But... You can you can look at the, the 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 six or seven in each of the traps and say mm -hmm. which one is this and once you label that louise once you can say you know i'm feeling so invulnerable i'm never going to be fired let's do the i'm never going to be fired one or i'm never my house is never going to go on fire so i'm never going to invest in insurance or you know etc but people do this all the time they underweight the judgment traps all you need to say is I'm feeling particularly vulnerable in, in, in a situation what am I guilty of so I could sit here and say identity does it matter if I say the wrong thing am I going to am I going to make a really bad well I won't make a bad choice because I'm sitting here doing it but I might if I was if I was if I was on a stage or on television I might I might make a bad call because because I'm feeling at risk that what if I get it wrong etc etc so but and also I, I think it's important to notice this isn't about the individual this is about three three levels the individual level yes you what you're doing wrong but also the organization the collective group so I've plenty of examples and I know the individual equals the collective in an organization but the, or at an organization level you get to culture and everything else when you're when you are when you're a fast-paced organization uh, an entrepreneurial organization a newsroom you are more liable to these to these traps than ever because it's so fast mm. and i do argue i do argue in the book that the biggest and most underestimated risk of all is actually human decision rate risk it's not mm. economic political and um it's not only economic political or technological or even climate risk because underpinning it all is of course human decision risk but people tune out People don't accept that, even though we know that 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 it's it's a major a major factor. So what I'm trying to do really is draw people's attention to this human risk and increase the level of responsibility that people take when they are in positions of power. Because the more power you have, the greater the consequentiality of you getting it wrong. And you will get it wrong if you don't at least um, consider consider some of these factors. And the, the evidence is there, uh, Louise. I mean, organization life cycles are down. They're down from 61 years to 18. M&A. And how, how, mm. how many articles have we all read on M&A? So we know the advice. And who listens yeah. to it? Nobody. So, mm. you know, miscarriages of justice, misconduct, all the fines, all the scandals, all the malpractice suits. So we know this because we're smart people. We just don't do it. So it's just trying to give people a different way of thinking about this. So... I do deliberately talk about deaf spots. So we know about blind spots. So, you know, with the best respect for, 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 for our, the fabulous Daniel Kahneman, who, who writes and wrote about what you see is all there is. I deliberately write about what you hear is all there is, or you think 
I mean, obviously it's not all there is, is what he meant and what, what we mean. Mm. But that's the point there, that what you hear is not all there is. Mm. And you must go to that extra level of detail mm. if you want to, you know, make sure that you avoid this predictable error. And it is predictable. Mm. The marvellous Daniel Kahneman, yes, who for yeah. many of us, uh, was our, our our gateway into the world of paper science uh, died yesterday an absolute uh giant uh too many of us uh, so a very sad day uh nula there's another aspect of the book which is um a fun aspect now we'll have to put the address uh, I'll I'll find the address of it and put it into the chat the fun aspect I'll tell you all of Nula's book, Tune In, is that you can go to the website. I'm just looking. I did write it down. Here I'll tell you what it is, if you like. Yes, it's please It's ulagewalt.com slash quiz. Because okay. I'm going to do a Nula post on it G, later. www.nulagewalsh, I'm typing as I uh, speak, dot com slash quiz. Yep. Super. I hope I've typed that correctly. I'm going to send that on to everybody. Uh, great bit of fun. You must all go on to uh, the website for the book, nulagwalsh.com slash quiz. Nula, explain what we can learn by answering this. Uh, there's about 12 questions, are there? Huh? There are actually 10, and each ten, one ten. Rel relates to the perimeters trap. And it was a very difficult thing to do. I had to really think about the scoring and which question I would ask. It's, it's, it's one question. So, and, and my scoring is quite is interesting. So if you say I always, so I, I can't even remember what they are in front of me now, but one of them might have been, um, do you, so if I was doing ego, it might have been, do you, how often do you rely on yourself rather than other people? It might be always, sometimes, never. Mm -hmm. So if you say I always rely on myself and my intuition, well, I discounted you, or I, it was like, I, that because, that is, it's because you shouldn't always rely on yourself, always. So, so what I did was I deliberately used the perimeters to, to test people and if they were overconfident so i deliberately wrote in the analysis mm. if you were a confident chris for example you know well done you you got 65 percent well you know there's, there's a problem now because mm. it's the problem there is is that if you are if you do get a lot of things right and we see this in in business leaders when you get to the top or near the top in an organization this 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 illusion of invulnerability re gets reinforced you think you always get it right and you've all these sycophants around you telling you how marvelous you are and mm. how you are such a great decision maker you're you're paid and you're promoted and you're lauded for these great calls you make and therein is one of the bigger traps mm. you are just on a precipice now because it is not humanly possible mm. for you to get everything right and that's when you must think well i've been lucky mm. smart and lucky not just smart smart and lucky so far Things have gone your way, but we know that in this noisy world, because the fundamental argument is that we we hear less than ever and we misjudge more than ever. So even if that was the only takeaway, you hear less and you misjudge more. That is a fact because the the evidence, you know, the, the actual numerical statistical evidence says that the rate of human error is rising, mm -hmm. and it's phenomenal in certain industries as well. So you know, even if you just think of scams as one very simple or school shootings missed terrorist signals missed fbi warnings they are getting more and it's not just availability bias and um, because i did i do i did check all the statistics and um, that we just hear about these things more you do hear about them more mm. they are also more sensationalized than than non-events but the fact is that they are increasing in a number in a number in too many cases so so doing this test i mean it's only a fun test but it's just a test to at least get people thinking Mm. I was I was careful I, when I when I was doing my when I was doing it up my sister did, did one she got 95 percent so I knew my scoring was wrong <laughs> and you cannot get 95 percent this is wrong so I don't so you can't get below 30 I know that because you're not going to get it all wrong um so there is so there is some margin of error so I, was, I deliberately didn't don't want I mean we don't want people to think that they are fabulous decision makers mm. yes we all get more right than wrong but that, but, but if you want to maintain your track record, you need to be much more careful because it's a noisy, distracting, mm -hmm. faster paced world where where we, we do hear less. And even if you need if you don't, if people think, well, what do you mean we hear less? Well, look at look at polarization, look at unheard voices, mm -hmm. look at the rising rate of activism. It, it, 
how many, how many, we read it all the time, employees and organizations, how many strikes do we have now? What's unheard of? In my day, as they say, you know, you had to, a company went on strike, you know, and there was, you know, hit the headlines for, for, for a week. Now you have not just industrial strikes, but you have people doing, so, you have employees grouping together employee power, making their voice really heard. Um, so you have that power of the populace and the power of the employee. And they do it. Why? Because they feel unheard. They feel people aren't listening to them. Mm. So they've tried. Look at Disney. Do you remember Disney? The case where Disney uh, and they were passing that bill and, you know, the management wouldn't wouldn't listen to them. It was a, it was a gay rights bill and they wouldn't get Disney wouldn't take a stand. So the employees, you know, did their strike outside and drew huge attention. But it's not. I mean, HP have done it. Uh, Amazon have done it. A lot of companies and employees who work for these big brands are doing it. But people are now learning from that and you have the cascade and the misinformation effect that that is just making people you know jump on this bandwagon so the evidence is there for greater activism and greater polarization so yeah and we've had three sort of particularly big cases that two of which you definitely reference in the book i'm thinking of theranos i'm thinking of yeah. we work uh, yeah. and now i'm just thinking of the sam bankman freed yeah, uh, two of which you definitely reference in this book situations where with hindsight reading the stories afterwards we think to ourselves how did it ever get this far mm. along the line and yet as you say mm. so swept up in I, I mean we still I suppose find it hard mm. to understand but they're perfect mm. examples of when people <laughs> tuned out well they are and actually actually the third one is in there as well is it? Um, yes. and, and there's a fourth one that which which is the british post office uh, the and, post, yes, and the most all recent of them, Louise, scandal the whole book could have i could have done a perimeters analysis yeah. of <laughs> any of those four yeah. and, and that is the truth and when i was writing i'm thinking oh i'm not really doing justice to yeah, yeah. you know to do any of these particular yeah. stories so I've tried to put a few links and re mm. and reference them in a few different mm. places. So I might I, I majored on one. So the introduction to every chapter has a story, um, oh, about and that it typifies the, the the trap. So so you're absolutely right. And I think ethics was the Theranos one, and I used WeWork for something else, and I used the British Post Office for the crowd effect from that. And so I think I did that. But I wanted to have done them all. But since then, I've actually written an article on the British Post Office. Mm. I had one for Theranos at the time, um. Because you're absolutely right. Pick any of the traps mm -hmm. and we could we could do a whole session on it here mm -hmm. and you can analyze what happened, not just the leader, but people who were complicit. And you, you probably read Max, ba Max Bazerman's work on, on, you know, complicity. My own research is on whistleblowing and the bystander effect. So combine all of those and, you know, which voices do they listen to? There's a there's a there's an interesting thread in the book about whistleblowers and so the, they could be dumb spots. So you've got blind spots, deaf spots, and dumb spots, people who don't speak up or people, or when you can't, when you, and that's why I urge people, when people don't speak, to try and go that extra mile. What are people really saying or not saying? So the whistleblowing is another example of, they, tu they tuned in, so the individual. So if you take Harry Markopoulos, for example, who you may recall uh, was involved in the Madoff, um, Ponzi scheme, as in he was the whistleblower in the Madoff scheme for many for many years before for nine years, Louise. Nine, nine, years. nine yeah. years he went ne to never that. being listened to, and reaching and out to the most, I mean, high levels of power to alert them to the fact that this was impossible. Unbelievable story, unbelievable story, and I'm sure a lot of people, you know, have read that. But here's another thread in the book. I do say. We rely on what who we see, not what not what we hear. Okay, so we know about first impressions. There is a theme about we're too reliant on the visual rather than the arrow. So with that in mind, Harry Markopoulos sprung to mind, and, and I did I just wrote a sentence on it. Harry Markopoulos was not the best looking chap by Hollywood standards, according to himself. He was a geek, uh, using his words. So if if he was of that orientation, he he definitely was in the out group. So even that alone made that he, he was less likely to be heard. And if, what's really tragic is that he raised this when, when, when the fund was, was six billion. Nine years later, it was 65 billion. 
They spoke to Harry Markopoulos himself, or sorry, to, to May Duff himself in prison. There was a Harvard um, chap, Eugene Saltes, who interviewed him in prison. And he said he couldn't believe that, that the people didn't, couldn't spot this, that like it was so obvious. How could anyone not see it? So some, and then there was a, there's a I did give an example of, of a chap in, in the book, Thierry, Thierry de la Villouche, um, really sad, really sad individual who Harry Markopoulos did go to speak to a financial advisor in France who, and he went to speak to him a number of times and really tried um, to get him to see that his friend, his friend Bernie wasn't all uh, that it cracked up to be. But so, so in fairness, this chap Thierry did analyze, he said, well, I've got the statements here. I've got, I've got the, 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 the statements in front of me and, I, and I've looked at them and I've checked them and they all, they all seem right and they tally with what's in the accounts and stuff. So he dismissed it. He heard what he wanted to. Um, and of course, he lost an absolute fortune and, and God love him. You know, he couldn't face it. Proud man committed suicide, you know, a week later. So really, really tragic. And he wasn't the only one. You, you know, other people, actually, ironically, I don't know if you know this, but um, Bernie Madoff's son himself uh, also committed suicide a year to the day that Bernie was arrested. And in the book, his wife, his wife, Bernie's wife, said that it was the greatest regret that she ever had because the son, Mark, um, begged her to, um, you know, basically leave the husband. And and she didn't. And, and she, you know, she said, you know, it, it was her deepest regret. So a misjudgment call. I mean, you can understand it, of course. You, no one sees it's easy to say it in hindsight and that's outcome bias. It's all very easy to say to see this after the fact. Mm -hmm. But that's what this is about, trying to avoid regret trying to at least ask the questions and you know she may decide I, i'm willing to live with whatever she wouldn't have thought there was those consequences but people are, may need to say i'm comfortable i can live with the consequences whatever they may be so one of the tips here is of course to to go to that end state and say what is the worst case that can happen here how likely is it to happen um, and then if so, what will I do about it? And can I deal, deal with or live with the consequences? Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you shrink the emotionality and the consequentiality of whatever decision it is that, that, that you're trying to make. And the fear factor slightly goes. So you've got a plan if the worst thing happens and, and or you're willing to accept and live with the consequences. And that's, I think, that's almost a route out of indecision and, 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 a, and a guide to, to making making better decisions. Now, uh, everyone who's uh, joining us on this call, if you have questions about the decision making process for Nula, do put them in the chat, and uh, we'll come to those as I see them appearing. The examples you give in the book, Nula, they're not all business examples. Your opening story very much uh, is along the theme of earlier. You were talking about sycophants and um, a story that everyone is familiar with, talking about Elvis Presley, surrounded by people giving him very bad advice. Maybe you'd just like to tell us why you decided to open with that story. I know it has a personal connection for you. And then to go on and sort of tell us about how decision-making impacted the king. <laughs> well, well, you know what's really interesting, Louise, that I actually had the book written uh, I had my introduction done and the, my editors didn't love my introduction. I'm thinking, so then I thought, okay, well, I need, maybe I, I had, I, my opening was the Jonestown story, actually. That was my original and I've, mm. I've used it elsewhere. Later my opening on. was Jonestown because it, it typified all of the perimeters. So mm. I did in the book go through the Jonestown cult where 906 people committed mass suicide. So, and jo Jones was the cult leader. Okay, so Jones mm. was the one that they were all listening to, et cetera. So, but it typified the people in there you know, underestimated the risks, accepted the stories, forgot their home life, dreamt of bigger things, etc. So it, it, it all worked out. And, and I did I did really analyze Jonestown to, and it worked. So so the but the, the perimeters trapped did 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 it fits all of them, but it fitted that. And I had it done and I did like it. I really did like it. And because I thought that, you know, I, it was good. Then hilariously, the movie came out and I was on a plane and I watched the movie and I thought, oh my God, this is decision-making to a T. And I went off, I must have read, of course, we all know the story. I probably have read, I read six to seven different books afterwards to, to write that piece. When I first, when my first version I gave to my niece and she said, 
you look like you're writing a biography where's decision making here yeah and she was right I got so engrossed in the story and, and the bits that I was learning and there's a phenomenal I mean it's way deeper way deeper than um just what we see on tv way mm. deeper um, but anyway so I read it I rewrote I rewrote it and I was very pleased that I rewrote it. it's probably the bit that I enjoyed the most mm, mm. because what I felt was mm. the greatest voice of all time according to whomever didn't I don't hear think you've actually mentioned that we're mattered. talking about Elvis Presley everybody sorry you did you did <laughs> yes you did you absolutely did mm. so that voice of all time didn't hear the voices that really mattered he made fantastic decisions musical and artistic decisions and he made appalling personal decisions financial decisions and health care decisions and the introduction I do like, I probably, it's probably the bit that I like the most because, well, I think it, we all feel that we would, have, we would have done differently. Of course, we wouldn't have done what he'd done. And if we had five jets and all that money, we wouldn't have delegated to other people. But he was at the top. He was afraid of losing power. He had ego. He had a temper. Um, but he was surrounded by, by sycophants. And, but he wouldn't listen. He wouldn't listen to reason. But his background story explains why. So this, this mm. desperation, this fear of, you know, being poor again, et cetera. So, but he mm. suffered the illusion of invulnerability and exceptionalism. So he thought that he could do no wrong. He was, he was clever. He, had, he did actually do a huge amount of research on all of these tablets and medic, medication, but he trusted the experts. Mm. He, he wasn't confident. So um, it both, uh, it, it, Jonestown or Elvis Blair is saying, mm. they both, the, the, the whole thing, the whole, it works for both. So, so I could equally have done a diagnosis through that. So I used him because uh, I thought it really mattered. I had actually been to Graceland 30, 40 years ago. And before I finished the book, the month before, uh, we were going on holidays to the States, um, or were we? Maybe I just made sure we were. Uh, anyway, so, so my poor husband got dragged, dragged out to go again. And um, it was fantastic, actually, because I want, didn't want to submit the book until I had written that 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 this last piece that said that I because I sort of felt that I I had come 30, 40 years my own in my own life. I did feel that I was putting my own decision making in context. And as I walked through those gates, I really did feel something. Mm. I'm not a fan. I should have said I'm not I'm not a huge fan. I just it was a story was so moving that like how could he have got this so wrong? How could any any of us get this so wrong mm. in our situations? So that was really the pull rather than rather than the music. I will say since I have started listening to music again, though different, <laughs> the gospel music particularly. But anyway, so that's why I used that as a story to, to and I used it uh, to, 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 to go the whole way through. I, I just used different examples of Priscilla, the, the, the acolytes, et cetera, as an example. So I used that and I used... Uh, the space story i didn't use neil armstrong and the and the apollo mission the three astronauts buzz aldrin michael collins there's a huge there's a huge mm. um thread there of that but it definitely is all ceos and all business mm. serial killers feature very strongly as well ted bundy john wayne gacy uh, i'm afraid they're all in there so uh, but again as i said i only picked things that had some meaning or some connection mm. to me that i liked and i and i really felt and so far people have been very kind and, and say and say they love it so yeah, as you say, there's a huge, there's a lot in there. There's a lot in the book. And as you say, as you read it through, you do feel that any number of these sort of chapters could be taken away and uh, expanded to a great degree. Maybe that's what you'll spend the rest of your time doing, Leela, <laughs> writing books about one chapter. And as you mentioned, there's quotes throughout the book. There's some fantastic quotes. Uh, I've just written this one down, quote by the Dalai Lama, when you, which I thought was absolutely perfect for this book, when you talk, you are only repeating what you already know. But if you listen, you may learn something new. Such a powerful mm -hmm. quote, mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. about the power of listening. And I'm just for for everyone who's joined us today. I'm actually just going to read out a few quotes from the book to give you a taster. These are all towards the end, but I I scribbled them down as I felt they were quite meaningful. And, so Nula says, those who stand out use behavioral insight as a route to exceptional judgment. I mean, that's that's so strong. Uh, most people want to do the right thing. Understanding how misinformation becomes a judgment killer reduces this risk. I mean, that's very powerful, isn't it, Nula? As you say, yeah. most people do want to do the right thing. Yeah. 
and yet the the power the power of misinformation you know we're so uh, as humans we are so vulnerable to it I and mean, any any amount of articles will read you know the impact of social media and as you say absolutely coming back to the title of the book this noisy world that we live in is is challenging to the most <laughs> intelligent and alert person you're not wrong louise an actual fact the quote i did i did i did put a lot of effort into the quotes actually and i, and I was very pleased with, with, with the quotes anyway that, that, that i used in the end but the misinformation even that you refer to i argue it's it's mental misinformation so we know that misinformation fake news is, is the number one global risk according to the world economic forum but we don't think about the misinformation of our minds and that's sort of what i'm trying to get to that if you tuning out it is a source of misinformation because you're not listening to the right voices but tuning in is a source of opportunity so i've deliberately given the good and the bad there so you're right most of the, the, the stories are for you know here's the warning but i i had to go to a lot of trouble to find these great ones as well mm-hmm. that refer someone to who tuned in and one of the one of one of another one of my favorite examples in there which we won't we won't have time you can read it is of an fbi investigator how he tuned in and what a story what a story i had the privilege of, of speaking to him afterwards and honestly I felt very moved myself listening to him. That mm. poor man who spent his whole career saving children t- torments himself now about um, about the children he didn't save. Mm. He, he was in the child protection unit and he, and he spent his life doing horrendous, horrendous mm. um, against serial killers. So um, anyway, you can read that one. But there's an example, for example, of someone. What, what story is he listening to? So he's retired now and all he's listening to is the, sto- the, the people that he didn't, the children he didn't save. And the, you know, and, and the terrible, terrible uh, stories that are there. But you know, he's got a fantastic book. If anyone's interested in his book, in the name of the children, it's called "Really, Really Moving." Thank you, thanks for that recommendation, Nola. And as I say, we are coming close to uh, wrapping up time. I do just want to ask you about another subject, which I know you and I have chatted about ourselves, uh, and it's when we had the conversation about generalists and specialists and uh, the danger of being amongst a group of specialists who in a way become too uh, focused on their speciality without sort of opening up their minds to what, you know, when we're talking about having teams of people and needing diverse voices, the danger then of being too narrow in your own speciality, which creates its own danger. Yeah, I mean, you're right. but if you're if you are a generalist or a specialist and, and it doesn't matter it doesn't matter which you are you still might be listening to a generalist and get it wrong or a specialist and get it wrong and, and i see vishal has a question there in the chat actually that sort of that sort of relates to that asking uh, about creating i think it's adam grant who, who suggests creating the your own personal board of advisors or somebody has suggested now everyone's suggesting it <laughs> um which is what we come to um, do I do you think it's wise to listen to the amount to, to increase the amount of voices you listen to so you get the broadest amount of perspectives uh, or picking fewer right voices? Fantastic well, question. A, Thank you, Vishal. It's a, it's a very, very good and very hard question. I'll go to the second one. Picking fewer right voices. Mm-hmm. You don't know which is the right voice. Someone asked me yesterday, um, Diane Pelly from, from Trinity, and she said, how do you know what the right voice is? And it's sort of one of those questions you don't want to get asked because it's so hard. <laughs> but what I because you can't you can't know which is no, the right no. voice, but you can know what's the wrong voice. And the wrong voice is the voice that's that's uh, the first voice, the loudest voice, the fastest voice, the most popular voice or the expert voice. If you are choosing your answer to whatever decision based on only those criteria and you're not doing it, what official says, mm. increasing your general wisdom, you are in a danger spot. Yes, of course, you broaden your perspective because the whole thing is about don't have a narrow perspective, but you can't broaden it so widely that you get you get punch drunk and you don't know who to turn to and you've got so many, you're just completely confused. Then you have to narrow it down. So you broaden the funnel, then you narrow it down. Mm. So so you can't go straight to A or B. And there is a there is a I do have a piece on binary thinking, which is, of course, is as bad as going too far at this side. Mm. So it is about as it is about narrowing it down. To the point where you know which is i go back to you have to you have to make the call at the end of the day so it's, so it's not that you rely on it on your own 
you may end up as a decision maker having to make a call off course. Mm. And but you but if you do that to the exclusion of listening to other people, the broad the broad piece, then you are in a danger. So it is a it is and because it's not, at the end of the day, you might be a consultant, a doctor, a therapist, a lawyer. It, it is based on your judgment call. Mm. But often you do ha- often have and to the make problem very is, quickly. That's right. And the problem is that people don't don't listen to enough people quickly enough mm. or often enough, rather. Yeah. That's very interesting insight, actually, not listening to the first voice. It's making me think of something I've just read recently. And they were saying about when you're brainstorming and having ideas and you would think that the first two or three ideas would be the best. But actually, they're saying, no, go on, go on, because once you get to idea eight, nine, ten, you're starting to dig deep and think more deeply. And in a way... That's sort of what we're doing with this concept of listening to voices. Don't listen to the first, maybe the second voice, but allow many, many to come in to contribute to the final decision making process. Nula, it's been an absolute joy chatting with you like this. I know you and I could go on chatting for the rest of the day, but we have come to the end of our session. Uh, really enjoyed hearing about the book that you've written, Nula. Um, And obviously we do recommend all of you to go away and discover Nula's book for yourself. It is absolutely chock full of very, very interesting stories, which, uh, as I say, I feel Nula could go away and create a whole other sort of library (laughs) around the content that's in there. Uh, So Nula, thank you so much for joining us today. I don't know if you have any sort of closing thoughts that you would like to share with uh, everyone who's joined us today. Well, well, not really, I guess. I, I do really appreciate people dialing in. I know how I know how valuable are everybody's time. And so I really appreciate you at least dialing in and uh, being interested in the book. I do urge people to buy the book, not, not for any reason except that I actually do think it makes a difference. And I do think it's something that people can go back to time and time again. So uh, I'd love to connect with people. I'd love to hear what you think in due course. I am on LinkedIn. I think most of us are on LinkedIn now, but really, really, I would love to, to hear from people. So thank you to everybody, particularly those who came, who've been dialing in very late or early in the morning. Yes, thank you, all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been lovely to see you all come jump on the call, as Nula said, in your valuable time. I hope that you've enjoyed everything we've discussed today. And thank you again, Nula for being our very lovely guest in this session of 42 Courses Speaker Series. Uh, Thank you so much. And do keep your eyes open for our posts of our up and coming speakers uh, in the next month in April. So thank you all very much.